We are now rolling, sir. Okay, so we can start. uh, So we know what we're doing. Well, (laughs) that's kind of a broad statement. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) we know know what we are discussing. Yeah, we know what we're going to do for this, this, uh, this podcast. And yeah. However, before we even get into that, I, I want to correct and there I, I made a colossal error in the last podcast that I want to oh, correct. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead. And that is that everything Michael Levy said about speaker measurements is right. <laughs> <laughs> how much how much Just did he kidding. pay you? <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. No, it's almost all wrong. Yeah. <laughs> the only thing, only thing he got right was that people do run measurements on speakers. Um but no, I, you know, we, in our zeal to, uh, to talk about that stuff, we completely neglected to mention who you are and why you're here. Oh, okay. And uh, your name is Dennis Berger. That's true. And you're a veteran audio video home automation journalist who has been working at this since the late 1990s for publications such as Home Theater Reviews, Soundstage, Wirecutter, Residential Systems. Um, I keep, I always think of DVD Angle because that's where you started. What's that? Cinelux. Cinelux, yeah. So a bunch of different people. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, so I I neglected to to explain who you are. So for that reason, we're not going to explain who I am. (laughs) <laughs> well, I think most people probably know mystery, who you are. Anyway. I'm, I'm, I'm the mystery man <laughs> um, of the podcast. Be, you may be the mystery man, but you're the star of the show. Come well, on. That's a real compliment to me. But I think it's wrong, by the way. But let's, let's stop talking about us, man. I'm getting uncomfortable. Yeah. Let's talk My, about the things that we're going to talk about yeah. when we talk about audio. Mm-hmm. To paraphrase Raymond Carver. <laughs> um, yeah. So the first thing we're going to talk about is mm-hmm. uh, something that is frightening, that would be frightening to me if I wasn't so close to retirement. And that's that um, the, it's an article uh, in The Verge talking about how Bing is going to, Bing will now surface AI generated buying guides. Mm-hmm. And we are going to discuss how that will probably affect the reviewing business, mm-hmm. how it will affect the high-end audio business and, and the high-end audio reviewing business, which mm-hmm. is, an, uh, you know, that is a definite, the high-end audio reviewing business is very much a part of the high-end audio business. Yes. And then we're going to gracefully segue into mm-hmm. what? A uh, video by Ben Jordan. Uh, people who aren't familiar with Ben Jordan, he's a YouTuber. I like him because uh, he covers a lot of stuff. A lot of it is about, you know, music production, things like that. Mm -hmm. Um, But um, I like his approach. I don't always agree with him, but he is always entertaining whether I agree with him or not. Mm -hmm. He's got a new video that I thought we should. Well, I originally just sent it to you for just the sake of something to talk about, discussion, whatever. But he's talking, the the, the headline here is 432 hertz. You might want to check your sources. Um, Mm. So short version of what's going on here. um, All of the music that you consume, well, most of the music that you consume, certainly all of the pop music and rock music and everything like that is, is tuned in such a way that an A is 440 hertz that's it's the middle that's the middle mm-hmm. a right a is yeah. It a yeah anyway and so but there has been you know for for quite a while now this this movement to say no that a should be 432 hertz for reasons right well, um, you know this is this is mm-hmm. i say this is relevant to high-end audio because there's been some discussion of this in high-end audio and uh shit audio actually came out with a little box that converts all the incoming audio to well it brings it down eight hertz in tuning really so if you have audio that's tuned to 440 it knocks it down to 432 i don't know i'm, I'm on their website right now and i can't tell if they sell it or not mm. anymore but yeah they showed it at rocky mountain audio fest a few years ago and i was just like what but rocky mountain audio fest isn't on april 1st that t- that's typically no, in they September. were serious Really? They were serious and it 
seemed to work. I tried it and, uh, but it doesn't look like they're selling it anymore. I guess probably okay. a lot of people, I'm, I'm, I'm a little surprised because it was shit audio. So it was cheap and seemed pretty well made and, you know, mm-hmm. but, um, yeah. what are we wrapping up with it this week? We are going to wrap up with something I noticed in, uh, Stereophiles coverage of the Pacific Audio Fest, which happened a couple of weeks ago. Um, Jason Victor Serenus talked about this Dutch and Dutch 8C speaker, which has been kicking around for, I think it's been about out for about five years or something, but it was his first chance hearing it. And he really raved about it. And he called it the best of the show. And what's interesting about it is it has a cardioid pattern uh bass response where some of the bass going out of the speaker, you know, normally bass is omnidirectional, right? Bass comes out of a speaker and goes equally in all directions. Whereas, you know, once you get into the mids and highs, they start to beam forward more or less. And so with, with a conventional speaker, but by canceling some of that bass response that that's going out towards the back, you're eliminating or reducing at least the effect of the bass bouncing off that back wall and so Mm -hmm. you're kind of making the speaker a lot more immune to room acoustics Mm -hmm. and we're going to discuss what this what this stuff does how it works Mm -hmm. and whether or not it really has a future in home audio yeah so all right let's let's start with the uh the the ai overlords taking over the earth yeah so you are the you're the ai guy you're like the ai master here I don't know if I'd have said master. This stuff moves too fast for me to master it. <laughs> it's, oh boy, it is moving at a lightning pace. Yeah. So, so what's happening though in in terms of our industry, and you know, both both in terms of of the reviewing industry, which is what we're really in, you know, which is publishing, and then the audio industry, which we're also in, which is you know making stuff and selling stuff. So how does, how, what is, what is, what is, well, first of all, what's going to happen here? What are they saying is going to happen? Well, best I can figure looking at the, um, the Verge story that you sent me. So, Mm -hmm. so a few months ago, I don't know, I don't remember what it was sometime before now, (laughs) um, Microsoft went into partnership with OpenAI and they have started integrating chat GPT functionality. It's not actually the same chat GPT as on the website, but they've, they've integrated chat GPT functionality into Bing search. And, you know, there's the Bing chat bot and things like that. So as I understand it now from the story, basically it's going to be a thing where that Bing chat bot is going to start being able to assemble buying guides by, you know, trawling the web and looking at reviews and looking in manufacturer specs. So basically, instead of going to a publication that does these sorts of buying guides, you just go to Bing and type in what is the best, you know, over ear headphone or whatever. Mm -hmm. And it's going to on the fly create that guide for you, right? With buy it now links and things like that. Yeah. Let's face it. There's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of these sort of buying guy websites now. And, and mm-hmm. I'm not, we don't generally talk about this, but you know, I, I work for one of them and it's wire cutter and you work for them too. And mm-hmm. we, and yeah, which means I have now have to say, I do not speak officially for wire cutter at least on this, on this podcast, yeah. nor for the New York times company. I speak only for the audio unleashed podcast. <laughs> 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 so, uh, anyway, there are a lot of buying guide sites like that now that have, that have evolved over the last five to 10 years. Mm-hmm. And, you know, where you go in there and you're looking for best laptop computer under $500 or whatever, right? Yeah. And, the, the, and, and that has become the standard for mainstream tech reviewing at this point. Yeah. Right? Right. And since you and I kind of straddle mainstream tech reviewing and high-end tech reviewing, mm-hmm. um, you know, it's, it's, it's a, an interesting difference. I, my personal feeling is this, if, if the first thing that you see, now this is just on Bing, which is like 8% of the, of the browse or the, uh, uh, what do you call these things where you type something in search engine, search engine. Thank you. I'm learning yeah. this internet stuff, you know, the, <laughs> the world wide web and, um, but they're growing. <laughs> 
they're growing since they started integrating AI. They they oh. are getting much more pop. The browser is getting more popular. Bing is getting more popular. And I didn't know this, but 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 a lot of search engines that we know by name are actually just reskinned Bing these days. Really? Yahoo, Yahoo, just uh-huh. Bing with the Yahoo skin on it. Um, oh my duck, god! So this so this isn't just going to be Bing. This is going to yeah, really duck, branch duck out go. to a whole lot of stuff. DuckDuckGo mm-hmm. is Bing with the DuckDuckGo skin. So no they're, they're, kidding. Uh, yeah, yeah. So they're actually the underlying technology of a lot of non-Google search engines. Yeah. Wow. And so Google will have to copy this. And so what you'll do is you'll you'll open your search engine, mm-hmm. and rather than go look for a website that has whatever information that you want, mm-hmm. you'll just search for best whatever. Yeah. And. Yes, websites will come up in your Google search, I imagine, you know, and you'll you'll find Wirecutter on there and you'll find CNN underscored and you'll find Forbes, whatever they call their Forbes thing and Wall Street Journal buy something. I can't, there's so many of these sites now. Review.com. Yeah. Review.com. Um, there's so many of them and you'll see that down the page, but the first thing you're going to see on the page is like, uh, if you search for a word, right? Mm-hmm. Then, uh, um, you know, like Yahoo or, or, you know, Google will offer up like a definition of that word. So you don't have to go to Merriam Webster. And that's the first thing you see. So I think what will happen is like people will look and it'll say, hey, instead of, you know, just an empty search bar, it'll say, you know, what do you want help with? What can I do for you? Mm-hmm. And you'll say, give me the best under $500 laptop. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you'll see that. And then you're going to, Pro- my, my guess is most people will probably go like, oh, okay, I'll just type in this and it'll tell me that. And it'll go out and, and basically kind of steal information from all these review sites, mm-hmm. as well as from manufacturer specs, mm-hmm. as well as from, uh, you know, uh, online reviews and basically wherever it can find information. And I'm sure that the AI will, you know, the, whoever creates the AI will probably say, you know, don't go get information about this topic from this source, maybe. Mm-hmm. Um, well, they can remove that from the training data. Yeah. Right. So, and it'll give you a list of recommendations with, uh, I assume, with affiliate links so that the, the search engine makes some money on it. Oh, yeah. And my big question is, you know, how, how good is that information going to be? And, and that's, that, there's a lot of people, a lot, a lot of professional reviewers who say, oh, that's going to suck. Mm-hmm. And I beg to differ. I, I, I do not agree that this is necessarily worse than, you know, a live reviewer for reasons we should discuss. We should. I yeah. I, I think we've been heading in this direction for a long time now. Yeah. And it's really, really easy to see the words AI chatbot and freak out and think this is a new phenomenon. This is yeah. not a new phenomenon for a long time now, a lot of the publications that I write for that are outside of specialty interests have mm-hmm. been so SEO driven that it is just what is it, uh, what's going to get SEO? What's going to get us up in the page rankings? What you yeah. know, it's and it is very much sort of shaping the language toward you've got to do this. You've got to put this here. You've got to respond this way. And it is to make it is to basically play Google's game or the, the algorithms game. Right. And, Mm -hmm. and I think in a lot of ways, especially over the last 10 years, our system has pushed, whether forcefully or gently, consumers into accepting very template-y content, right? Yeah. (laughs) You know? Yeah, sure. Because... It just floods the market. That's mostly what is out there now. Template driven stuff that is oh, yeah. designed to appeal to the algorithm, not to the reader. Is that fundamentally different from this? I don't think it mm. is. And, well, you know, you, there, there are two ways you can use SEO. You can use SEO as guidance. Or you could be a slave to it. And you've got the mm. discernment, right? The thing is. The AI doesn't have discernment. These, yeah. these neural networks are just pattern seekers. That's that's what they are. Right? Okay. I think I think you remember a few years ago there was an AI that was generated basically to identify different types of pastries. Mm-hmm. And the reason it was designed is because in Japan they like unwrapped food, right? They consider mm-hmm. that a sign of quality. And this bakery basically wanted to just be able to take unwrapped pastries and run them through a scanner and go, "Oh, that's a bear claw. It's, you know, however many yen." And then some doctors realize, oh, crap, if that thing can identify pastries, it can look at moles and identify whether they're 
cancerous or not, right? Yeah. And so they took the same training data set and fed it. And do you know what that AI quickly figured out? What? The tape measures cause skin cancer. <laughs> I'm sure you would like for me to explain why. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because it turns out when dermatologists were looking at and taking pictures of skin blemishes, mm -hmm. if they were pretty sure that it was cancerous, they would put a tape measure beside it so oh. they could note in their data of this is a however many millimeter growth. And a lot of times they were correct. So <laughs> this... This AI that was designed to seek patterns recognized a pattern. Tape measures correlate with cancerous growths on the skin. Oh, my God. Because human discernment is not there. The human discernment yeah. was in, in the taking of the photo with the tape measure. But this, this neural network does not have discernment like that. Yeah. So All right. I, got yeah. a, I, got a, I got a question for you. This okay. is going to be just, just to see how this AI stuff relates to audio and see what oh. the effects of this all might be. Mm -hmm. What will the AI say about which is the best Ethernet switch for audio? <laughs> <laughs> e, that is a good question. <laughs> and we say this because there's been a big fight on Facebook with uh, Doug Schneider from Soundstage, who was our guest last week. Mm -hmm. um, and our friend. You know, Po yeah, and friend uh, posted a thing on Facebook basically saying how stupid this Ethernet switch thing, this idea that Ethernet switches can improve your audio. Um, that there's any rationale for audiophile grade Ethernet switches. Right. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah. And so it, it erupted in a big fight in a, a torrent of, of uh, irrationality. Is that a word? See, and, I, I disagree. I think their behavior is completely rational because most of the people that were arguing for the veracity of audiophile grade networking switches mm -hmm. had a financial interest in doing so, right? Right. So arguing that point is going to increase their bottom line. That sounds pretty rational well, right. to me. You're right. They, they, but they don't, <laughs> you, you're right. And it's, it's unconsciously rational though, because they actually do yeah. believe the stuff and they don't have the critical thinking skills, I'll, I'll just say, to... To understand what you know, real scientific testing would involve, which none of these mm -hmm. people do, and that brings us to another point: mm -hmm. is that okay? You're replacing reviewers with you know human reviewers with something that kind of goes out and just grabs whatever information it can find. Mm -hmm. Well, how bad is that really? Because human reviewers have, as we've talked about many times, uh, human re reviewers have a lot of foibles. And mm -hmm. I don't really necessarily blame them because being a really, really, really top-notch reviewer, what, what I think of as a top-notch reviewer, means a colossal commitment and not that much monetary reward. You know, you're going to mm -hmm. have to actually, you know, go read all the technical materials. You're going to have to keep up with you know, you have to slog your way through some AES papers. Mm -hmm. You're going to have to, uh, you know, go out and explore and go really try to understand the world of audio. You probably have to do some measurements at some point. Yeah. Um, and doing all that stuff is a giant commitment and you are not going to get paid a lot of money for it. Yeah. So I don't blame people for wanting to be a reviewer for some site and just kind of getting some new set of headphones in and put them on going like, oh, I like them. And, and oh, I have two other sets of headphones and here's how they compare to these and blah, blah, and whatever. And you don't really understand the way headphones interact with amps and you don't understand recording or anything like that. But, you know, whatever. And so, mm -hmm. but that person is not really going to have a, a sophisticated appreciation of that headphone's pros and cons. Right. And is it really going to be that much worse to have the AI go out there and, and scrounge up a bunch of random information and throw at you and say, well, you know, lots of people seem to like these Sony headphones. And so you probably will too. Yeah. It, what I'm about to say is going to sound like I'm disagreeing with you, but I'm really not. Okay. I think you just made a really, really good case for why we should value human reviewers more and therefore pay them more. Well, true, but you're kind of dreaming, pal. I mean, well, I, I am. I am. I wish musicians got, hey, man, if musicians got paid more for streaming, I'd actually spend more time probably doing that. I know. But I mean, was just saying they should, though. They should, right? Yeah, I know, but should. Come on. I f a few months ago, I wrote an article for Cinelux called The Problem with Rotten Tomatoes. 
Mm-hmm. And the, the, it was all a sort of great big analogy for AI and the direction that we're heading. And, and the place I started from was Rotten Tomatoes is built on aggregating reviews from real humans. And if we merely rely on Rotten Tomatoes and we ignore the reviewers, then they go away. And where does Rotten Tomatoes get its data from? Right. Where does it, well, where is it getting it from? And, and, that's and, that's, and, and I made the point about that in, in terms of AI, AI image generation, which, you know, I'm big into, mm-hmm. I'm terrified of it, but I'm big into it. The point I made was if we stop valuing artists and we, we see these AI images as good enough, right? Which I got to admit, I'm a little bit of hypocrite here because for my purposes, a lot of times they are good enough. If I just need to yeah. quickly illustrate a story, fine, they're good enough. But the thing is, I made a prediction. If we stop valuing artists and illustrators and the only pictures we're seeing on the web are these AI generated images, they're going to choke. They're not going to have any new creativity to feed on because they're not creative. They are pattern recognition yeah. and generating robots basically and i predicted that was going to be you know a few years from now the web is going to be so flooded with ai images that these text to image generators aren't going to have real human output to work from and they're going to start to suffer their images are going to start to degrade guess what that was a couple of months ago that's already started to happen wow there's so amazing so much ai imagery on the web that the ai's that generate the imagery or they're, they're like, they're becoming an Ouroboros and their quality is degrading, right? Yeah. Well, you know, it, what is this? What is to stop that from happening with this chat thing in Bing? What's going to happen when you stop having people feeding it the information that it draws from? It's just going to be manufacturer specs. Well, it, that's, that's just the point I was going to raise up. And that's mm-hmm. that I think that with so much of these things are just going to go by the manufacturer specs and the manufacturers have always, not every manufacturer, but a lot of manufacturers have always gained their specs. And for example, I just tested a FOSI audio, which is one of these companies that make these little tiny amps that are, you know, 20, 30, 40 Watts. Mm -hmm. And they're like a hundred dollars. I just tested one. It's a lovely little amp. It actually works fine. It measures pretty well for what it is. The power rating is 300 Watts into four ohms. And this thing is the size of a of a very small paperback book. Yeah. And you know, I measured it. And it was something like 44 into 8 ohms and 50 something into 4 ohms, which is fine, you know, for 89 or 100 bucks or something. Yeah. Um but you know, no one's going to measure that except for me probably, maybe some YouTube guy. Yeah. And you know, but then again, the people that so many of the people that do these reviews now just go look at the manufacturer specs and print them and say, hey, here's the specs. And how many reviewers understand these specs at all? Let's, mm. let's face it. They yeah. look at, uh, yeah. oh, 300, that's more than 200, therefore better. Mm-hmm. And yeah. so I don't, I, it's, <laughs> it, this is like, a, I, I feel like I'm glaring into a, a big black hole of, yeah. of a future of, at least mainstream product reviewing that I, that is just, it's just this point so extremely unpredictable. What do you think though that let's ignore the high end for a minute and let's, let's focus okay. on as much as our hobbies and interests intersect with the mainstream. What do you think that we could do to add value that, that can't be amalgamated and synthesized? All right. If I have to be honest with you, mm-hmm. um, I look at a model like our You've mm-hmm. seen them, right? Oh God, I love them. Yeah. It's a, it's a review site. They're extremely measurement focused Mm -hmm. and I don't think that's necessarily a good thing. Um, Mm -hmm. but, but they do a good job on the measurements and they do a pretty good job of, of, uh, you know, uh, evaluating and explaining those measurements. And there's not much to read on there. It's not stereophile where you get to read some guy's adventure with a $5,000 tube amp, Mm -hmm. but, um, you know, it gives you all the, 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 just an extraordinary amount of information about like a Sony, whatever headphone, right? Yeah. So you can go onto a site like that and get something where it's clearly above and beyond what an AI can deliver. Now, whether or not people will actually go to a site like that. And I, I mean, there's probably stuff on, uh, 
There, I'm, I'm going to guess there's stuff on our things I don't really understand. There's probably stuff on there that they don't really understand, frankly. But you, I mean, you can, you look, let's face it, with measurement gear, you can run a zillion trillion measurements. And a lot of those things are in there just to give that measurement company a competitive advantage, mm-hmm. not because they actually tell you anything useful about the product. Right. So you can go, I learned this real fast when I started doing measurements back in 1997 or something. Um, you can just go crazy presenting measurements. And I think our things kind of does. Um, and, and probably of all those measurements, two or three are actually useful. Yeah. But, you know, they are presenting something that an AI can't do. Whereas an mm-hmm. AI, if you look at a, a typical headphone review that's on a typical website, an AI can basically kind of do, and, and especially given, as you're pointing out, how sort of formatted and, and regimented these websites are, an AI can do that. Um and can you distinguish between the human and the AI version? I don't know. Uh, now, if if the if the editor said, "Hey, go wild on your writing, really make it fun," mm-hmm. and the and and <laughs> and they actually like let that pass through, um, then you might have something that would draw people in. But given how how regimented all this stuff is, it's going to be tough for humans to beat AI from a from a reader perception standpoint. And in fact, I have to wonder if, look, if you get in the comment sections of any of these sites, you find so many people just trashing all the reviewers for being on the take or whatever and blah, blah, and this and that and that. Mm-hmm. And which is almost never the case no. in mainstream product, I, I, you know, in, in, in some more quote unquote elite specialist sort of reviewing in smaller publications, maybe, but the big giant media companies all have pretty strict ethics rules, right? Mm-hmm. But but people still make these contentions, and I wonder if people will think will somehow think that the AI doesn't have these imagined ethical <laughs> yeah. you know concerns, even though the AI can be written to you write an AI, whatever whatever the people do to make an AI. The AI can be created. Well, a lot of to, times they don't know, to be honest with okay. you. Okay. <laughs> but the, but the AI box. can be created to yeah. favor, you know, it could be that, you know, you're, you know, Joe Blow's search engine. Yeah. And, you know, you, you know, Sony might offer, let's not say Sony. Let's say just some other brand, because I don't think, I actually don't think Sony would do this, although I don't really know. But I do know that other brands have offered me, I, I've gotten emails from people saying, hey, if you make this our, the top pick, you know, we will give you, a, you know, we will double our normal affiliate rate. Mm-hmm. And, you know, what's to say that an AI couldn't be, and now, I, <laughs> As don't, if we I don't have anything to do with affiliate. Like, I like don't even, is- I don't even, like, I, I don't, I, I have nothing to do with that. And neither, I think, does hardly, nobody on the mainstream sites does, to my knowledge. No one I don't I even know the to. names of the people that do the affiliate program f- for the stuff we write for Wirecutter. Like, I don't even know who they are. Right. I met them, <laughs> I've met them like once or twice. And I, yeah. I, I don't, I don't, because, God, I have like, I don't know how many guides I have on there, but I don't have time to keep up with all that crap. I get, no. I don't get, and I don't get paid for that. No. So anyway, um, but there's no reason that, that, uh, you know, a search engine would have some, how, somehow greater ethics than a human writer. In fact, it could have less. It could, it could, you know, the search engine could be written to where the AI search engine could be written to where it goes out and scans all the available affiliate deals and shoots you up whatever it gets the best deal on, whatever it's going to make the most profit on. Oh, yeah. That's not a difficult equation. Yeah. So. Well, The Verge talks about also like Microsoft pimping the Surface headphones too in their own promotional materials, <laughs> basically saying, hey, here's this thing developing and you ask for headphones and look, it's showing you the Surface headphones too are great, right? Yeah. Well, that's convenient. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh boy. I mean they're um, like they're saying the quiet part out loud. I mean, they're not even trying to hide the fact that they're going to game the system for their own benefit. Like why would they? Yeah. Well, I will say there's one good thing about this. Mm-hmm. High-end audio magazines will be fine because mm-hmm. people read that for the story, for the yeah. adventure, you know. And they're not as our good pal Steve Guttenberg who knows as much about the high-end audio industry as anybody as he says People don't read these magazines for buying information. They read them for entertainment. Yeah. And I think he's right. I think there's yeah. some level of buying information in there that people might go by. But 
they read it for entertainment that they read it like the same reason people read fancy car magazines yeah absolutely you know? Anyway, I think so. we've uh, talked about this enough. We've driven this topic into the ground. So yeah. uh, do you want to take a break, get some water, powder your nose? And I do. Come and back. Let's and move on to our next topic, which will be the 432 hertz 432 hertz. Yeah. All right. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Audio Unleashed. I'm Dennis. And I am the mystery audio <laughs> dude. You're such a weirdo. No, I don't know what worth. Yeah. It's no mystery. Yeah. Um, so what are we talking about this segment, man? We're going to talk about something that is a mystery. <laughs> <laughs> Which is, um, there's been a kind of deal going around, that, which I never heard of until about five years ago, um, about whether music should be heard with a tuning reference of A440, which is 440 hertz for a middle A above middle C, mm -hmm. and then, or a reference of A432. And there are those who say, and please jump in here because you're far more plugged into this than me. There's a great video that we found mm -hmm. about this. And who's, who's the, tell me about the guy who did the video and tell me a little bit about the video. Ben Jordan. Um, ben Jordan is a guy that I've been watching for a while. I originally stumbled across his channel. He does a lot of music production stuff, a lot of uh -huh. audio related stuff. And I originally found his channel because I am, despite the fact that I am not uh, a musician, I am fascinated by analog synths. I always have been. Okay. I'm just, just utterly consumed by them. And he did a video some while back about an sort of analog synth emulator and you watch somebody's video then they're going to you start going to get recommendations for other videos by them and i just sort of become a fan of his because he's got i like his approach to stuff i think he's he is science driven in in large part mm -hmm. when it's applicable it's not always applicable but i just think in terms of audio production and music production and so forth He's one of the guys that I've found to be most reliable and and least likely to feed me some um, BS conventional wisdom. Yeah. You know, um, he he's done some really cool stuff like outside of the realm of production. He did a really cool video a while back. I can't remember what it was called, but it was it was something to the effect of like the physical limits of loudness like how how huh. loud okay. is like basically effectively infinitely loud right or, mm -hmm. or or what is the loudest sound that could be creative so stuff like that it's just it's it's just a really cool channel overall and it's a little scatter shot but effectively if you like audio unleashed you put you might like this guy so all right um, so yeah. what, what does he say about 432 hertz he basically breaks down the conversation about 432 hertz, the history of it, talking about, you know, the the w one of the big claims about 432 hertz is that 440 hertz was a Nazi invention mm -hmm. and it was created basically so everything that we listened to would sound bad and have ill effects on us. I don't really understand completely that argument but he basically goes through the history of the development of of 432 hertz as a as a new tuning standard new proposed mm -hmm. tuning standard the history of what people have said about why 432 hertz is better for you and he just sort of deconstructs all of it and he also one of my favorite things that he does in this video is he pulls out several scientific papers scientific mm -hmm. studies that people have done 
about, hey, here's why 432 hertz as a tuning standard is better for you, like in terms of your health, right? I think most average people would have said, hey, here are studies that that like confirm this. Like this is science, right? We have mm -hmm. to believe science. More than anything else, one of the coolest things about this video for me is that he deconstructs their methodology and shows you how to question the methodology of any scientific paper to determine whether there's actual validity to this. Is the sample size large enough? What are their biases and so forth? So I thought it was really, really cool in that respect. Okay. What do you think about it? You're an actual musician, man. You make for real music. So I, I think your opinion on all of this is way more valid than mine. Well, what do you think about it? I have to say, there's, I, I did find that you know there, there's this is relevant to high end audio because mm -hmm. there I wouldn't normally think it would be. I mean, you can actually go find music on various streaming services. It's been detuned to 432, mm -hmm. and it's a subtle difference. It's not a big difference. And I also found um, I, about five years ago or something like that, I was at the Rocky Mountain Audio Fest and shit audio was there. Um, S C H I I T, um, right? I think I keep. S C H I I T, yeah. 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 So, and they showed a, a little experimental box that would detune your music to 432 mm -hmm. and assuming it was in 440 in the first place. And I should point out some orchestras tuned to like uh, 441 or 442 in Europe. Mm. Um, 440 is not a universal standard, but pretty close. And um, I think so, for popular music, it's a pretty, pretty standard though, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And so, um, Except for punk, where who cares about tuning? <laughs> and we should say, we should say to be to to not be so Eurocentric. Indian classical music, they're I'm not entirely sure they have an accepted standard. They tend to just tune to each other mm -hmm. wh wh wherever they're at. Yeah. Somebody decides, like, yeah, I'm in tune, so you guys tune to me. Um, <laughs> well, because also with Indian classical music, you don't typically have harmonic movement, and so right. it's, it's a whole different thing. But. Yeah. Um, so there's a good article I found in Positive Feedback, though, about uh, positive-feedback.com, which is a high-end audio website. And this article is about the, it's by uh, Juan Alion, and it's about the 432 Evo high-end reference music server. And he kind mm. of really breaks a lot of this stuff down. And this thing is actually intended to where you, you can rip CDs with it. You can, you know, run it from a USB source. You can, I guess, stream through it. Uh, you can, it's got analog input so you can play your vinyl through it if you want to. Um, and it basically detunes, assuming 440, it detunes everything to 432. Mm -hmm. And he kind of breaks into it. He, he digs into it a lot. And he talks about a, uh, a radio broadcaster and music reviewer, Alan Cross, who basically said that the, the 440 hertz works on the third eye chakra, which regulates thinking. Mm. while 432 hertz stimulates the heart <laughs> chakra, which is feeling. Yeah. Now, yeah. yeah. The, the whole idea is it's supposed to make you feel more relaxed, mm. but it kind of starts to remind me of those ads that are like, you know, like in Audio Advisor where they have all those, you know, the, the Audio Advisor uh, website and catalog where they have all those quotes from readers that are like, you know, the mm, audio yeah. quest whatever cables you know were a, <laughs> you know made a major difference in my system the music sounds calmer more relaxed yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, who the hell decided that it should sound calmer and more <laughs> relaxed i'm sorry that's right. ridiculous why why should music sound calmer and more relaxed well, calmer Would and more relaxed. Would this podcast be better should. if I was calmer and more relaxed? <laughs> I mean, no. it's just it's just absolutely ridiculous. I hate that kind of high end crap. Assuming that music should sound a way that you like it to sound. I mean, none mm -hmm. of my music sounds relaxed because I'm not relaxed when I play music, frankly. Yeah. Yeah. And maybe if I'm playing Girl from Ipanema for the 10 millionth time and I'm tired because I've been playing for two hours, it probably sounds relaxed because I'm just kind of like, yeah, whatever. <laughs> and But, you know, it's not, I, I don't like it when people impose their own aesthetic on the music. And if the music is, is tuned, is, is, you know, conceived for A440, leave it in A440 and although I'll tell you the musician, if you say, hey, I think your music sounds better in 432, you know, 
because I bought this doohickey that detunes to 432, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the musician will say, all right, mm, yeah. <laughs> whatever. Yeah. And and if you say, well, you should you should tell your band members to detune to 432, and the musician would be like, get 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 away from me, please. Yeah. Um, yeah. But to be fair, the writer in positive feedback is he's kind of mixed. I think he likes the product a whole lot, but whether whether he really buys into the 432 thing is really questionable. Mm -hmm. Um you know, he says, you know, he didn't hear the 432 magic, but then he kind of raves about the sound of the product and he he had it, I guess he was running it at 432. So it's a little hard to tell what his, it's a little hard to break out his perception of the 432 from the product itself. Yeah. But, yeah. you know, I just think that it's another, it's something, look, it's, it's, it's good as a thing for people who want to, you know, for whom... You know, the music's not enough and you need to do something to the music. Oh, it's better if you do it this way. Mm. Right. Yeah. And some people dig that. And if it, if they enjoy music, listening to music that way, that's fine. I don't care as an, as a, a musical artist, mm -hmm. um, you know, the five people who listen to my music, if they want to run it through a 432 D tuner, they're more than happy to. But the only problem is the music that I do for the end of this segment is going to be in 432. So if you run that through a detuner, you could probably, it might send you into a coma. <laughs> It'd be like staying in a hot tub for too long. Yeah. Don't do that. This is, we're, we're getting into some dangerous territory here. Yeah, we are. We are. We do. You, unless you check it, you don't know what, what reference standard the music was tuned to. Yeah. So if you accidentally put 432 music into these, it's going to be a, a real train wreck. Right. And right, the, the right. effects are unpredictable. <laughs> Actually, they're extremely predictable. Yeah. And the effects will be nothing. Nothing. But, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but your, your perceived effect is completely unpredictable. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, Should man. we move on to another segment now that we've, we, we've come up with a definitive statement about 432 hertz audio? I think we have answered this question. Yes, sir. Let's take a, a break really quick and listen to some <laughs> 432 mm. hertz music from you. It's, yeah. it's not going to sound like whale song here. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Dial it back up a little bit. It's just 8%, I think. or No, not 8%. 8, 8, 8 hertz, whatever. Yeah. <sighs> Anyway, yeah, let's take we'll a break. See. We'll be right back. Okay. All right. This is Audio Unleashed with your hosts, Brent Butterworth and Dennis Berger. And Dennis Berger, that's you. Yeah, that's me. Okay. The guy with a good radio voice. <laughs> so not that this is radio, but you know, radio-like. Yeah. And so the last article we're going to talk about is one by, well, we're gonna, the article that led us into all this discussion is one by Jason Victor Serenus. And he uh, writes Stereophile. He is probably most notable for his extensive, first of all, for his classical reviews in Stereophile, which I love. Mm -hmm. And also he, he, they shoot him all over, all around the world doing show reports. And so he went to the Pacific Audio Fest a couple weeks ago, which was up here in Seattle. And he wrote uh, JVS's best of PAF 2023, Dutch and Dutch 8C all-in-ones. And this is a speaker from a company called Dutch and Dutch. And they're 15,000 a pair and they're fully active. So they're, you know, all the built in amps and everything. And uh, so 15,000 a pair isn't a, a super crazy price for something like that. But mm. the neat thing, yeah. he's just raving about the sound of these speakers and they've been out for about five years. So for him to kind of jump in there and start raving at this point, I mean, he, he admits like, look, I just never heard him before, but um, he's really raving about them. And what's really interesting about these speakers is it's part of a new trend, which is also discussed in depth in 
Did I mention this loudspeaker design cookbook eighth edition yet? I think I've heard something about it. The, yeah. This fans guy. Yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He makes As always, we will, thingies. we will, we will put a link to the book in the uh, description below. But it, the but show it, notes. Caught, it cool. caught me because I've actually, so what, what happens with these speakers is they're called uh, cardioid speakers, basically. And, you know, mm-hmm. we know the term cardioid from microphones. We're both speaking through cardioid microphones right now that have a cardioid is, you know, heart, right? Heart. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it's a heart shaped pattern. So you have pickup mostly from the front and not from the back, which is mm-hmm. what you do with most microphones because they want to pick up stuff coming from in front of them and not behind them. Right. 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 Do we want to do so, a demonstration? Like I can say, like I'm snapping my fingers in front of it now. Yeah. And then I'm going to snap my fingers behind it really close. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So excellent, man. And th- that was you're, uh, that was you're equally really distant using from this medium to its full advantage. <laughs> so I never know if you're making fun of me or not. <laughs> you can always assume I'm making fun of you, but it's always with respect. Probably. So yeah. <laughs> unless the topic is the Grateful Dead. But <laughs> anyway. Um, on to cardioid speakers. So the idea of these things is, you know, when you put a speaker, uh, you know, in most cases, there's going to be a wall behind it. Mm-hmm. Might be a couple feet away, might be a couple inches away. And that wall is going to have effects on the bass. It's going to change the sound of the bass when the bass reflects off of that wall. Now, normally bass is omnidirectional. Bass radiates in every direction from even from a front firing speaker or a down firing subwoofer or whatever. Bass mm-hmm. radiates equally in all directions, right? Yeah. But with these speakers, they actually use a cancellation mechanism that's partly acoustic and partly through uh, signal processing that cancels the bass wave that goes behind the speaker. It, you mm-hmm. know, partly, it largely cancels the bass wave going behind the speaker. And as Vance describes, so Vance devoted, Vance created a new, in the loudspeaker design cookbook, created a new, I feel like, like Marianne Williamson talking about A Course in Miracles. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Well, wow. because like she would uh, it, like, like I actually saw Marianne Williamson a long time ago and she, she just constantly brought up the Course in Miracles. And I'm like Marianne Williamson constantly bringing up the loudspeaker design cookbook. <laughs> so the loudspeaker design cookbook is to me what A Course in Miracles was to Marianne Williamson. <laughs> and Van Stickison's already getting in his car to like drive up from Portland to shoot me. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> Anyway, back to the loudspeaker design cookbook. Yeah. Eighth edition. So he actually added a whole new chapter on studio monitors Mm -hmm. and uh, which, which is really, really well done. And he did put a lot of research into this, not only from his own knowledge, but he actually interviewed people about like, Hey, what's the difference between studio monitors and regular monitors and uh, regular bookshelf speakers. And the general consensus was, well, kind of nothing. Um, but he talks about this category because it, it kind of has been bigger in studio monitors. And he shows you a lot of uh, test results from these monitors and from the, the Dutch and Dutch HC. Also from, uh, there's a brand called Key, K-I-I. Mm-hmm. It's done by Bruno Putzies, who's really famous for his Purify amplifiers. Mm-hmm. Um, and they basically kind of cancel that bass back wave so it doesn't interfere with the with the bass that's coming out of the front of the speaker. Okay. The mm-hmm. problem that you get is advanced details in here is the problem that you get in professional recording environments is usually those speakers are up against something and, you know, pretty, pretty close. And there's a big, the, the since that back wave of the speaker goes back and then come and bounces off the wall and comes back, it's out of phase, out of phase. at some yeah. frequencies with the front wave. And mm-hmm. so it creates a big dip between about 70 and 150 Hertz. Okay. And he shows how these speakers can get rid of that. Mm. And by the way, you can't cancel a dip like that with EQ because the more you try to boost your way out of it, the yep. more cancellation you're going to get. Yep. So you have to do it acoustically. And so anyway, Jason's like raving about these speakers. I will be honest with you. I, I, Bruno Putzi showed me these things at, uh, you know, the key speakers at Rocky Mountain Audio Fest years ago. Mm-hmm. And I didn't know who he was at the time. His, his reputation wasn't quite as well established as it is now. 
And I walk in a room and this guy's like showing me, yeah, do you see it? So they cancels, it cancels the back wave and it has all these extra drivers and blah, 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 blah. Because you cancel the back wave either with extra drivers or with some ports and with some processing and et cetera, et cetera. So yeah. I'm, he's like, yeah, 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 revolutionary speaker. It's going to cancel the back wave and all this kind of stuff. And usually when people tell me revolutionary speaker, I, I'm just like, okay, it's another one of those guys. Mm-hmm. <laughs> But it turns out he's not. And later on, I kind of learned more about him. Like, wow, he's a serious dude. But the fact that Vance has written about this in the Loudspeakers on Cookbook and, and devoted considerable analysis to it and really talking about how useful it is makes me think that this could be a real – It's look, It's there's a lot of good speakers from the early 90s or even earlier where it's, you know, a, a tweeter above a woofer with some kind of reasonably done crossover. And those are still good speakers today. Mm-hmm. And so you can argue that other than in manufacturing, there where, you know, because stuff is with Chinese manufacturing, so many speakers are so affordable now, much more than they used to be. Mm-hmm. Um, other than that, there haven't been that many big developments in loudspeakers. But I think this is big because this basically eliminates a lot of the effects of of room acoustics, at least yeah. in the lower frequencies. Um, and I, I will say, like, you, I agree with you, no you know, huge mm-hmm. advance, but I think most of the development that has happened in the loudspeaker market over the past, I don't know, what, 10 years, something like that. Mm-hmm. I did an interview a while back with the guys at Paradigm where they were talking about how they are having to adapt to the new trends in, in interior design and architecture. And back when you mm-hmm. and I were writing for Rob Report Home Entertainment, I think there was a tendency towards very soft furniture and very soft surfaces and things like that. And the guys at Paradigm are saying, like, that is just not how homes are being built anymore. And it's not how people are decorating them. So we are having to make modifications to the waveguides and things like that to account for the fact that, you know, rooms by and large now are much brighter, right? Yeah. So but but that's a tweak. That's not reinventing yeah. the wheel. Like this is a this is a big deal. This is a big development. So it's a big development, especially for the high-end market, I mean, for obviously for the recording studio market, but also for the high-end speaker market, because Mm -hmm. this is something that actually works and something that can make your room a lot less relevant Mm -hmm. and can make dialing in your system a lot easier Yeah, and can deliver more consistently good sound. Now, whether or not, now these are all the, the, the key speakers, I think, I think when he showed them to me, we were like 15 grand. So now they're probably 20. These Dutch and Dutch are like 15 grand. I don't know. Uh, Vance mentions a couple of other brands in here, but I don't know if anyone has done this at a really affordable price point, but I, I don't see why it couldn't be done mm. at, by, um, God, Dayton Audio could do this. Oh, Yeah. You know, yeah. I mean, they make really affordable stuff. And also they make a lot of guts, you know, they make a lot of plate amps and things like that. Mm-hmm. And as well as drivers. And, I, you know, actually, I'm, that would be a cool thing for somebody to do because Dayton Audio, you know, Parts Express, um, the, the two companies are linked. I'm not quite sure how, but anyway, I, somebody from, you know, one of the DIYers ought to do this. If they have, I mean, maybe somebody already has, I don't know, but some DIYer ought to, ought to figure out how to do this. And I mean, that would be a real technical accomplishment and yeah. it'd be really nice to see a PSB do this or, uh, or, or a, a triangle audio do this for a couple thousand bucks. Cause or maybe SVS. They could. SVS, SVS, you know, SVS. Have their prime wireless speakers, which are just amazing. Ooh, SVS can make a version of this. Oh, and they have the technical sophistication to figure it out in about five mm. minutes yep. and they could make it and sell it for two grand. Oh Yeah. And yeah. that'd be really cool. Yeah, because their prime right. wireless speakers well, are like, what, 800 bucks? And they're like, really dang good. Yeah, so. I don't know if anybody from SBS listens to this podcast, but uh, in case you do, the gauntlet has been thrown down. <laughs> yeah. And, um, and we hope to see this. But this is something that uh, you can go read Jason's article and then you can go buy the loudspeakers on Cookbook, edition yeah. 8. Yeah, this is this is our this article is not in the older edition. So we keep saying, well, look, if you don't want to spend 130 something, go get one of the older editions. Yeah. But um, but yeah, you got to you got to pony up for the the new one. for this. Yeah. And 
you can read a pretty in-depth analysis of it. And mm -hmm. um, he also mentions uh, Aaron's audio corner has a review I, of the I Dutch and Dutch. About to say uh, Aaron, let's see. Like last week or the week before, I can't remember, mm -hmm. Aaron did a new video, his five favorite speakers at any price point. And the Dutch and Dutch 8C was one of them. And yeah. um, and he talked a good bit about it and then linked to his original review. That original review is one that everybody should watch also because, you know, we talked a few episodes back about how, you know, he did that new segment about the, the Genelec speakers was sort of explaining how technical measurements and objective analysis mm -hmm. translates into listening. In that old Dutch and Dutch uh, HC review, he really goes into that. He takes the his 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 measurements, and one of the things that he does, you know what, Michael Levy should really watch this video because one of the things <laughs> that uh, that Eric does <laughs> That's <gonna> is, <laughs> is talks about how you can take anechoic or quasi anechoic measurements and predict in room response, mm -hmm. and then he shows you the prediction versus reality of the in-room response with these speakers. Mm -hmm. Really fascinating, really informative. I think everybody would get oh, something out of it. That. But I think I think Michael Levy could uh, really learn a few things from that video. So. All right. What do you think the odds are that he's actually going to listen to our podcast ever again? <laughs> Slim to whatever. <sighs> I'd say so. the odds are far far better that uh, I will become a famous rock star. Mm. Yeah, that could happen. You, know, you never know. I'm 61, but you know, I'm, I play bass. Okay. Yeah. Could happen. To get very my, well. Maybe my yeah. new tune that's in four, this tune to 432 Hertz will <laughs> finally be that it'll get, it'll be go viral and people are like, Oh my gosh, this tune makes me feel so calm. Upload it to uh, Spotify and and put, you know, 432 Hertz it'll, in brackets and it'll, it'll, it'll take it'll off. Be, I, I, this is going to be like, what was that? Nora Jones tune. Um, Don't know why. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It'll be like that. It'll make people feel calm and they'll like it because it <laughs> makes them feel calm. And I'll make a whole album of music that makes people feel calm. <laughs> <laughs> oh Shall yeah we wrap this up oh let's wrap it up man i think we've said all we have got to say although i'm going to reiterate people go watch aaron's audio corners review of the dutch and dutch hc and also watch his uh, five favorite speakers thing because i think it was really good really informative and i think you're going to learn something we will so. have uh, links to all this stuff in mm -hmm. the in the I don't even know where you put those links. Show you notes. put them somewhere. Show I put notes. them in the show notes, yeah. So. And where are the show notes available? Well, like if you're on iTunes or on uh, Spotify or anything like that, they're they're basically, you click on the, on the cover art when you're listening to the episode mm -hmm. and they'll pop up. If you're on YouTube, they're just down below the headline. You have to click a little expand button, but they're there. So, huh. yeah. Okay, good to know. Yeah. I've, not, I've not actually done that. Oh. Wow. I don't listen to this once, once, <laughs> once we've, once we've edit, once someone's edited it and we've agreed that it's, it's of, you know, adequate quality. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that's it. That's yeah. it. We're done. Well, well we got to do some credits, we man. Yeah, we got to do credits. I want to give a shout out to our first three patrons. So, uh, Jeff and Daryl and Chris, thank you so oh, much awesome. for supporting us. You are keeping us unleashed or at least helping to do so. So I think between the three of them, they're almost paying for our podcast hosting. <laughs> so so wow. if we get like, if we get like three more that would pay for the recording. Wow. Yeah. And then there's the website. Yeah. Yeah. So who's editing this thing? I'm editing and mixing and mastering and all of that it's my turn and this is a production of what this is a butter burger production now here's a much more complicated question mm -hmm. who did the music well you did all of the good parts of it well i did the intro and outro music mm -hmm. and then i did the second piece of music that's in 432 hertz mm -hmm. but the piece of music before that which was a sly reference to <laughs> let's call it an homage an homage an to the homage. end by the doors yeah. an homage to the end by the doors mm -hmm. because that tune was as you and i read about the ai reviews <laughs> we both had that tune humming through our heads yeah yeah so uh and that was that was i'll i'll say i'll i'll explain it dennis conceived that mm -hmm. and messed around with i guess a drum machine and a midi keyboard mm -hmm. and came up with some parts that kind of did that and then i kind of 
messed around with some guitar parts and then Dennis mixed it all together into a big, you know, circa 1970 psychedelic mishmash. Yeah. It's really cool. fun to play around with that with you. So, well, you can you can judge the success of that. You, you, have, <laughs> you have already judged the success of that. If you've gotten this far, you've already heard it and you've already decided whether or not you liked it. So, you know what? We should put the whole track on our Patreon. Sure. Yeah. Or at least the whole like two and a half minute thing, whatever. So, yeah. Yeah, let's do it. We'll put it on our Patreon. Good God. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Are we done? We're done, man. See you in a couple right. of weeks. Bye, everybody. Bye. Hey there, thanks for sticking around to the end. If you enjoyed this episode and you wish that there had been more of it, we've got good news for you. Yeah, you can, if you check out patreon.com slash audio unleashed, all one word, you can get new episodes a little earlier than everybody else does. Yeah, sometimes it's like a day or two, sometimes it's nearly a week. And plus, extra bonus, you actually get extended cuts of each episode, which could be like an extra five, 10 minutes. It could be an extra half an hour. It's just whatever we decided that we didn't want to cut, but we had to cut to get to our usual hour. Yeah, we never know how long it's going to be. But, uh, you know, for you, there's only one way to find out. Yeah. And the way to do that is you subscribe to our Patreon for three bucks a month, which is, you know, less than I spend on my daily cup of coffee when I go to Starbucks or the library to write my boring articles. Yeah. One more time with that uh, URL, that's patreon.com slash audio unleashed or audio unleashed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, everybody.